Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Don, Don Miguel, welcome to the show, mate. Hi, guy. Okay. How you doing? I'm very well, very well. I really appreciate you coming on. I, um, oh, thanks for inviting me. I have a question that I ask everyone on the show mm -hmm. uh, to kick off. And let's say you visited Australia tomorrow and, mm -hmm. uh, and you came to an Aussie barbecue and uh, a complete stranger came up to you and said, hi, my name's so-and-so. What do you do for a living? What would you say? Uh, I usually say, would say I'm an author and lecturer. I would say that, although my main gig is father and husband. That's the that's the real job, you know. Yeah. Uh, everything everything else is just moonlighting to that point of view. <laughs> Fair enough. I, and they probably would then ask you, well, what do you write about? You know, I've no doubt that conversation would would end up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've gotten used to that one. Um, well, mostly self-help, you know, uh, I share my family's tradition, which is Toltec, which is uh, several generations old in our family. So each generation teaches it in its own unique way, and I get to teach it uh, yeah. according to the world and experiences that I, I've, ex I've learned. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. Now, and, and my first question is, is on the one thing I want to ask you, because when I was doing a lot of research, obviously I was familiar with your father's work and and that was what exactly is Toltec? Because I'm from Wales, and it was you know it's a word I'd never even heard before, to be honest. Yeah, well, it's 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 a culture, you know, as a civilization. The Toltec existed over 500 years ago, and they ceased to exist either with the expansion of the Aztecs Empire or the Spanish Empire. Regardless, it ceased to exist. The word Toltec is a Nahuatl word. Which the Nahuatl is the language of Mesoamerican language that in English means artist. If I translate the phrase, the Toltec art of transformation into 100% English, it means the artist path of transformation. So I'm an artist oh. and the, the art, the, you can say this is the tradition of the artist or the artisan. And for us, the canvas for our work of art is our life. And the instrument we get to use to create that work of art, it's this body, it's this mind, it's my will, my intent that allows me to move my arms and my legs and create thoughts in my mind and be able to share them and express them with you. So to me, that's the work of art that I create. And it could be either the most perfect nightmare or the most perfect harmonious dream. It's up to me and my co-creators. Yeah, okay. That's a beautiful answer. It's beautiful. And I wanted to ask you as well, I, and something that fascinates me was that I grew up in Wales. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a very, uh, obviously very different environment. My, you know, it was almost like my culture was rugby and beer. That was <laughs> what I kind of knew and, and, and grew up in that. And then it's almost like I kind of stumbled across this work probably 10 years ago and mm -hmm. slowly started becoming open to it and aware of it. And I've gone down the rabbit hole, if you like, and, and it's yeah. changed my life and it's been absolutely amazing. And I'm forever grateful that I'm on this path. But yes. I, guess, I guess my question to you is, is what, was it, what was it like growing up as the son of, of Don Miguel Ruiz? Because, because it's such a different environment and you've been exposed to this work, obviously, from such a young age. Sure. Well, uh, I would say I'm the oldest son of Don Miguel Ruiz, which means I got to experience Dr. Miguel Ruiz, the, the, the man who was before the Don. Uh, you can say growing up, the spiritual figure of the family was my grandmother, Madre Sarita. You can say that it, she, when I was born, she was already in her mid-60s, and she was already that spiritual figure head of the family. And Don Leonardo, at that point, uh, I guess he was close to passing away, or just he lived very few years in my life. So, but the majority of my life was Grandma Sarita. So I grew up with juxtapositions, con continuous duality. You know, you can say growing up, my father was Dr. Miguel Ruiz, uh, a neurosurgeon, general, general surgeon. And my grandmother was a faith healer and uh, also a spiritual leader. You know, she had her own little temple in San Diego in a little area called Barrio Logan. And every Thursday and every Sunday, she would give the sermon to the community and during the week, she would do consultations with, the, with her patients and do cons, uh, faith healings and things like that. So you have that contrast between, yeah. you could say, old tradition, uh, 
medicine, you know, if, if you want to use it holistic, you know, that, that might be a good word to describe it. Different worlds that adapt it, you know, so it's a, in that world, that was the part of the duality. Plus, I grew up in San Diego, California, but I went to school in Tijuana, Mexico. So in the morning, I would commute from my home in, in the United States, cross the border into Tijuana, because I was going to private school there, and be educated in Mexico. I would cross the border back and I'd be an American. So I grew up with that duality of, or juxtaposition of two cultures. So right there, I was something being I was used to. On one hand, science and, and logic, and the other one, spirituality and faith. Come add that to it, uh, Mexican tradition and American tradition, and it was all combination. So as my father let go of the medical field, his parenting style changed, you can say that. He went from demanding straight A's to, like, to a point where like, all right, let's try your own strengths, experience the consequences of your own choices. You're responsible for your own education. It's your life, that kind of thing. And uh, which was different from Don Miguel Ruiz, you know, the, the, the doctor, the yeah. apprentice, mm -hmm. the student, the shaman, and then Don Miguel, like each one, it's a parenting, parental technique was different. And as the parental technique uh, changed, so did the man. And he became more spiritual, more engaging, more encompassing, more like he still loved us, but he let us experience our own consequences. He was still there trying to help us. So you can say that somewhere along the line, my father merged the two juxtapositions and made it into one. To us, you know, for example, medicine and, and homeopathic remedies, they're all part of the spectrum. And the whole point of it is to help you heal. So for us, it's just an instrument, Western medicine, uh, all Chinese medicine, uh, homeopathic, traditional Mexican, all that kind of thing. Which one is going to allow me to resonate with? You know, which, which one is going to keep me healthy and which one is I'm going to use if I'm sick or if I'm an injury? You know, that I'm going I'm to choose the one that allows me to get healed. It's just an instrument. Yeah. So that, you can say that, that ability to see it as an instrument is how my father taught me how to handle knowledge or everything I knew. It's an instrument that informed my choice, but I'm the one making the choice. So right there to that point is everything that led to being raised by this family, by Don Miguel Ruiz and Madre Sarita, that taught me to have confidence in myself to make choices and to respect myself to experience the consequences of my own choices. And that, that's exactly it. And of, of course, there was always love. My father loved me just as I was. Like, love was not the motivator. So you can say Dr. Miguel Ruiz did love conditionally. Uh, Don Miguel Ruiz did not. He loved me unconditionally. Amazing. So you can say it's a transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned a word there as well, which is choice. And I sometimes think we can get very paralyzed from making choices mm -hmm. that especially when it occurs change mm -hmm. do you think that um th there's th that's almost like a skill to to embody as well doing that because i think we try and have so much control in our lives and and it can be very difficult in making change and then we don't, we don't make choices well i would say that it all depends on how we were raised you know some of us you know you can say that the Four Agreements, Mastery of Love, Voice of Knowledge, all my father's books, my brother's books, my books, we all deal with the same problem, which is domestication, a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. If we live up to the expectation, we get the reward. And if we don't live up to the expectation, we get the punishment. And since part of our experience of perception of life is to perceive things through our emotional body, that reward, when we live up to the expectation, feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And the, and the punishment feels like rejection and the lack thereof of love. It's the way we've learned conditional love. I love you if. And one of the things, one of the consequences of that domestication, besides loving ourselves conditionally, is that we begin to lose control of our own will. Because somewhere along the line, our domestication was corrupted and well, the best way to control someone else's will is for that person to give away control of that will to give away permission to control it and the best way to do that is to make you doubt yourself to make you doubt 
your own capacity to make a choice, to say yes and no. And, and with that self-doubt, you let someone else control what you say yes to and what you say no to. And that's where domestication comes in and corrupts it. So because of that, some people were domesticated more severe than others. So it's different for all of us. It's, it's not really that rigid because we all have different versions. You could say our parents shared with us what they knew. Some of our parents, some, some of them were domesticated very harshly and they shared that tradition with us. I love you if you're worthy of my love, if you live up to the expectation, you get the straight A's, you make this much money, you make this, you make that. What kind of son are you? What kind of daughter are you? And that kind of thing. That's conditional love. Got it. Yeah, so that, I, you, I, you get to the extreme of the other part. So somewhere along the line, in that severity of domestication, we lost trust in ourselves to make a choice because we gave away that trust to someone else's point of view. Yeah. Could you give us an example of domestication? I've heard you say one once in an interview, and um, I, I thought it was spot on. Uh, would you be able to give us an example of one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, um, I used the, the one I used in the book, uh, okay. in The Mastery of Self. It's the one it's similar to what I've experienced. So it's, it's, my, it's my story. Um, so let me first contrast that to what free will is. Free will is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. Yes represents that three letter, it's that three letter word that represents the moment where I make the choice to use the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest anything. It's, it's the thing that makes me the infinite possibility because I can go in any direction. All I need is to say yes to that direction. Compare that to no, which is a two letter word that represents the moment where I make the choice not to use the energy that animates this body and animates this mind to, to manifest a single thing. My no is just as powerful as my yes. So when I say yes and no, I say yes because I want to say yes and no because I want to say no. This is personal freedom to be able to make the choices in my life to go in any direction in life. And when I don't like the direction, I can say no to that. That's personal freedom, to say yes and no, to express my will like that. Got it. Contrast that to domestication. Now, imagine me at the age of eight. And at the age of eight, I'm learning how to assert myself, which simply means I'm learning to say yes and no. And it feels good to say no. Because up to that point, I'm doing everything they're telling me to do, but now I've got a voice and I'm going to say no. Forget about the terrible twos and the terrible eights, because now I know how to talk. Yes, no, no, yes, and all that kind of thing. Then comes my grandma with a bowl of soup and she puts it right in front of me. And she says, honey, eat your soup. It'll make you big and strong. And I go, no. But honey, don't you want to be big and strong like Popeye, like Superman? No. Mind you, at that point, my grandmother only wants to nourish me. She knows best. And it's all about nutrition at that point. She knows that this soup will nurture me and give me strength to grow and do all these things. So, she, but she respects me. She's respecting my no, but she's trying to persuade me to change that to a yes. So she goes to what she knows best. Look, here comes the plane. <laughs> no, 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 no. After every no, little by little, she gets frustrated. And she gets to the point where she's tempted to cross a line of respect. And she decides to cross it ever so innocently. And she says, mijo. Don't you know how many kids don't have anything to eat here in Mexico and around the world and here you are wasting food? Honey, it's a sin to waste food. Ah. For one, I don't want to look like a selfish child in front of my grandmother's eye, but I really don't want to look like a sinner. So I say, yes, grandma, I'll, I'll, I'll eat the soup. And as I fin begin to eat the soup and I finish the bowl, my grandmother comes to me and says, that's my good boy. I get the reward. But here's the thing. She got me to change that no into a yes because she gave me a moment of doubt. Now, this is an innocent, innocent example. There's a lot more people out there who have had much, much more severe than that. But here's the thing. You have to be careful what you tell an eight-year-old because fast forward uh, 34 years later, I'm 42 now, and I go to a Mexican restaurant and they give me a plate this big of food. At least they call it Mexican food. And I begin to eat. And halfway through... My body tells me the truth. I am full. But consciously or subconsciously, I hear, it's a sin to waste food. Consciously or subconsciously, I say, yes, grandma. And I continue to eat. 
Because in that moment of clarity, where my body was telling me the truth, there was a belief or a condition that overruled my no, and I turned that no into a yes, and I went against myself. Because now, not only am I stuffed, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Because when my body was telling me the truth, it was telling me, I'm full, I'm satisfied, I'm happy, I'm feeling good. But when I let that belief change that no into a yes, now I feel pain, I feel uncomfortable, I don't feel satisfied, I feel over whatever. I went against myself in that moment because a belief or a condition was that strong that I allowed it to control my yes and my no. And that's because we humans are the only beings that are able to self-domesticate, at least as far as we know. Right. When we domesticate a dog or a cat, sorry, cat domesticates us, a dog. <laughs> when we domesticate a dog, we have to be actively domesticating him. In my case, a brownie. In order for brownie not to pee in my wife's, uh, in, my, in, my, in our corner of the house or eat my wife's shoe, we have to be actively domesticating him. But if we leave the door open and me and my wife are not, not really paying attention, not only will he try to see if he can get away with peeing in that corner or eating my wife's shoe, but if he goes outside and escapes, he'll go back to being what he always was, a dog. Mind you, he'll keep some of the trauma here and there, some of that stuff, but by, by and by, he will go back to being a wild animal and trying to survive in the Sierra Nevadas, which I wish him luck. It's a Shih Tzu Bijan. I wish him all the best. <laughs> But when we humans, when our domesticator stops actively domesticating us, we continue to domesticate ourselves. How? Well, if I'm the one that's talking inside my own mind, who's listening? I am. Well, if I'm the one who's listening, who's talking? I am. And that's when my mind becomes my active domesticator because I continue to believe in conditions, to believe those beliefs that were taught at such a young age. That's how I believe controls it. And the only reason why it's subconscious, like I was telling in the story, is because I've done it so many times that it becomes automatic that I don't even think about it. That's how it becomes subconscious, that I've mastered it so many times that it becomes such an automatic reaction. So domestication happens actively from human to human. And when that human learns these conditions, it continues to believe it until it until it no longer, no, no longer believes it. So to me, this is the example of domestication. Yeah. I love myself if. This, I, can, I can relate to so many examples of that uh, of myself. Question that popped in there, with grandma, with the soup, could she, could she have acted differently? And if so, how? Well, at that point she did, up until she reached the moment where she was tempted to cross a line, and she did. She crossed the, the little line. And mind you, we're, we parents, we totally understand what that feels like. You know, we want our kids to eat or do what we want them to do and all that. But, you know, if you, bit, if you give scrutiny to this, yes, you can look at my, what my grandmother said at that moment. But if I give a scrutiny, if I give that belief skepticism, is it true that it's a sin to waste food? And I've asked people, I've asked ministers, priests, my father, and all of them have said the same answer. No, it's not a sin. It's a waste of food, but it's not a sin. So it didn't survive my scrutiny. And I'll, I'll go to my grandma. She passed away 10 years ago. But grandma, I forgive you. I totally understand why you did what you did. I have kids on my own, and I totally relate why. We're always tempted. There's a, that line between respect and disrespect of power, wanting to control someone's point of view, of imposing and subjugation. But grandma, can you forgive me? In that scrutiny, I became aware of one big truth. She only said that once to me. I've been saying it to myself for four, th 34 years. So it's been me who's been going over and over and over, letting that belief continue to have control over me because I continue to, to, so, to a certain extent. Yes, my grandmother said that thing that time, but here's the thing. I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control the will of another individual. I don't control their perception. I only control mine, which means, yes, my grandmother could probably have had a bit more patience and not cross that line. But what mattered most is how I used it to go against myself for all those years. So the person I'm truly wanting to forgive 
It's not not just necessarily my grandmother, which I forgive, of course, but myself, because I'm the one who kept saying yes to it to such degree that I became a master of continuing to believe in that condition. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Then if we become aware of it, we're all of a sudden somebody's listening to this and they go, oh my God, I can think of a belief I've been running over. Because so, I'm, I'm guessing there's so many beliefs that we're not actually even aware that we're, we're running. Mm -hmm. What would you advise to someone to A, become aware of it and then B, change that domestication? I mean, you spoke about forgiveness then. Would that be it? Or Well, the, the very first step is awareness. You have to become aware that it's happening. That's, that's a requirement. Because if, you, if you're not aware that you're just going to continue. So at one point, you become aware of it and you give it scrutiny the way I described it. Is it really a sin or whatever? And it's not, it doesn't survive. It doesn't survive. Now, here's the thing about a belief. It's easier to contrast it with what the truth is. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not. That's what Neil deGrasse Tyson said, as beautifully said. That's what the truth simply exists with or without me. It's something that is a universal truth, right? Yeah. A belief only exists for as long as I say yes to it. As soon as I change that yes into a no, it ceases to exist, which means a belief needs me for it to be to exist in some way. And the more people believe it, the more it feels real. But at any given moment, it can change. At any given moment, just look at the history of our world. Look at how many times borders have changed, cultures have changed, names of countries have changed. It's, it's time and time and time, it, beliefs have changed. There's an expression here, for example, I live in a red state. I live in a red state. In the 1950s here in the United States, it meant that you lived in a socialist, communist state, and fighting wars, depending on who you say that to. Fast forward to 2018, I live in a red state, means that you live in a state that both conservative, Republican, and fighting, depending on who you say that to as well. The, the phrase remained the same, but the culture changed from 1950 to 2018 so much that the phrase means something different to a culture that handles that symbol differently. So you can say that our words are all empty symbols whose definition is subject to agreement. But a belief is also subject to agreement. It requires someone to actually believe it. And it will only exist until someone no longer believes it. And if you look at history, that happens time and time again. Yeah. So if you look at it from that point of view and put it where it really matters, which is in our own personal life with ourselves, those beliefs that says that I am not worthy of love, they are lies. They're, they're just beliefs. Anything to do with that kind of thing about rejection and love and all, it's just a point of view. To love myself is to see myself as I am. And to respect myself is to experience the consequences of my own choices. Because the thing about domestication is that we corrupted how life teaches us, which is action, reaction. For every action we take, there's a consequence. I love using this example. Imagine right now you and I are using electricity to talk to one another across the, across the ocean, yeah. across the Pacific Ocean, both you and I are talking to one another, using electricity that allows us to talk in near real time. Now, action, reaction. If one of us, or let's just say me, if I pay the electric bill, the consequence is I'll have electricity to have this conversation. If I don't pay the electric bill, the consequence is I won't have electricity to have the, this conversation. That's it. Neither good nor bad nor right or wrong. It's just a consequence. Which consequence do I want? Sometimes I only have money to pay electricity or food. Which one do I pay? Food. Because I need to nourish my body in order to have the strength to come up with the money to pay for the electricity. That's action reaction. Domestication looks like this. If I pay the electric bill, then I'm a stand-up, responsible individual, a good citizen, whom I will loan money to because he can control his money and has money to do that. But if I don't pay the electric bill, then I'm a bum, I'm irresponsible, I'm not a good citizen, doesn't handle money well, and, well, definitely won't lend him any money. Do so you see the difference between the two? And one... Mm -hmm. And, and one is just a consequence. I want to live up to a standard of being 
look well by other people, so I'll pay the electric bill, even if it means getting into debt to pay it, to live up to an image that doesn't exist. In this one, I accept the truth. This is my reality, this is how I used it, and there's no problem. I'll just which consequence do I want? And if I want electricity, then I'll do the work that allows me to get the currency, that allows me to pay for it. Action, reaction, neither good nor bad, it's just a consequence do I want as opposed to this one. And you could say that there's, some people, it's hard to notice the difference, but in reality, there's, it's world of difference. One is, this, this is how I want to live my life, this is the consequence I want. And if I can't live up to it, I accept the truth. In this one, I'm pretending to be something I am not for the sake of someone else's judgment. Yeah, got it, and that's why, like you said, being the observer and awareness of starting to notice these patterns coming on and then we can make a different choice in that moment and tell ourselves a different belief. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Because that why I wanted to talk about as well about authentic truths and sometimes mm -hmm. we, we quite often struggle revealing, I guess, our, our truth, our vulnerability, the essence of who we really are. Mm -hmm. and yeah. It, would it be then fair to say domestication is, is probably contributing a lot to keeping us from, I guess, stepping into that and, and living our truth? I would say yes. In, in, in diff each one differently, of course. You know, there are 7.5 billion human beings. We're going to be all uh, impacted by that domestication differently. Some of us are, are so rigid with it that we can't even tell the difference between free will and domestication and a belief. Some of us do. It all depends on the individual. Yeah. So our authentic self, to me, is just a word. You know, our, our authentic truth is just simply being this being that is me. It's the difference between seeing myself as an identity or experiencing myself as a living being. Because as a living being, I am the sum of every decision that I've ever made. Every decision, every choice has led me to this point at this very moment. But at the same time, at this very moment, I'm the youngest I will ever be. I have my whole life ahead of me. How do I want to live it? How do I want to engage it? I'm still that infinite possibility that when you hold a newborn baby boy or girl, you know, it's easy to see the infinite possibility when you hold a newborn baby because you're looking into the eyes of someone who has their whole life ahead of them. Well, the difference between the baby that my parents held 42 years ago and the man who is talking to you right now, besides the fact that I grew up is that I've learned how to use my will. I've learned how to use my mind, how to use this body, but I'm still that infinite possibility because I have my whole life ahead of me. But here's the thing, saying that, I can't go back in the past and change a yes to a no or no to a yes because life no longer exists there. It only happens in my, it only exists now in my memories, in my mind, and it probably didn't happen the way I think it happened. The future doesn't exist yet. It is the consequences of the choices I make now, which means the only place where I'm able to express my will is in this present moment, which means at this very moment, this is me. This is the living being that is getting to make the choices. Who am I? What am I? I can use identity. I can use the mask. I can use all these things to try to describe who I am, but it will only encapsulate but a portion of who I am. So to know myself, that authentic truth, or my authentic self, whichever one we want to use, is to simply allow myself to enjoy the experience of being me. This is me, flaws and all. Whereas domestication only wants to see if you live up to the expectation, you live up to that image that doesn't exist, but it's that image by which we model ourselves, then we're worthy of love. But if we don't live up to that image, then we're worthy of that rejection. So when we see ourselves from that point of view, which we, one, one would call ego, the function of ego is act, to see ego is actually easier to see as a function rather than a concept. The function of ego is to keep that image alive, that illusion alive, that image of myself. For example, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. <gasps> I don't know the fourth agreement. Oh, no, how can I call myself <laughs> Don Miguel Ruiz Jr.? And a diatribe of self-judgment kicks in, punishing myself for not living up to that image of perfection, which is to be completely free of any flaw. And then I'll be worthy of love. But if I don't, if I don't live up to that agreement, 
then I am worthy of my own punishment. And even though so, doing that, I corrupted the four agreements and turned them into the four conditions of our personal freedom because now I'm using them to domesticate myself. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the illusion. That's, the, that's how I corrupt myself, trying to live up to an image that doesn't exist. In this case, Don Miguel Rich Jr. doesn't exist. Who exists? Me. The living being that is engaging you right now. The living being that is evolving and changing with every moment of life, with every experience, with every mistake, with every success. And I'm learning from that. So right now, I am the, I'm the sum of all the decisions I've ever made, and I'm the youngest I will ever be. This is me. That's amazing. A living being. I'm alive. Why do we fear it, do you think? The f fear the, the true self, like operating from that level? Because we still believe in our domestication. We still believe in conditional love. Okay. And how, like, how, how will we know how to love ourselves? How will, I, how will we know ourselves? We, we like a pain that we're used to or we, something that allows us to understand ourselves. It's, it's the thing. It's, we're used to it. It, it. Sometimes it requires that willingness to let go. You see, a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. But a moment of clarity that's followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. So in that moment, we have a choice to continue to believe in an illusion in that moment, meaning the moment of truth, a moment we become aware of it, or we decide to change direction. So some of us don't recognize that moment of awareness. Some of us do, but we go back to our illusion because it's what we know. But if we realize that we're not happy, that is that the decisions are really impacting us in such a way that we're not enjoying our life, then we decide to change a direction. And you can say that's where a lot of us, not just in the Toltec tradition, but throughout the world, who all of a sudden want to rechange our own story, change the narrative, at least change the elements or at least situations that allows us to let go of the things that are making us feel unhappy and begin to do the work that allows us to enjoy being us. It's, it's, it's work. It's the work we do that allows us to, well, be happy with ourselves. It, it, because it's easier said than done, of course. All this stuff is easier said than done. But once we decide to make it, it's, a, it's our decision. You know, this, it's because we want to. It's, it's, it's not I have to. It's I want to. Is this what kind of life do I want to live? So to, to me, that's the pivotal point. And all of us will answer that differently. Yeah. And then that's... <laughs> It sounds so simple, but like you said, it's, it, I'm sure putting it into practice is a very different, different concept. Well, that's the thing is that, you know, like we, conditional love domestication is learned. You know, that it, there's a reason why I used the word subconscious before, because it takes practice. A, a teacher once taught me this expression, which is beautiful. The key to enlightenment is effort. That's it. That's the key to enlightenment, effort. Effort. Effort, to me, simply means that I use the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind, to make a movement, to take a step, to, make a, to take an action, to go, take a step in a direction I want to go. Discipline is remembering to apply that effort every day. Success is following through. So basically, we grab something like the Four Agreements or, or the teachings of the great masters of the world or teachings of someone who resonates with us or a psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever group counselor, all of a sudden we hear their words and instead of domesticating ourselves with it, like we could domesticate ourselves with the four conditions and the telltale sign that we're domesticating ourselves with the four agreements is if you judge yourself for taking things personal, if you judge yourself for making an assumption or not being impeccable with the word or not doing your best, then you're using the four agreements to domesticate yourself. You just reprogram something to make it fit, but you're still doing the same cycle. The way we do it is to, for example, Let's use not taking things personal. It starts by accepting the truth. Hello, my name is Miguel Ruiz Jr. and I do take things personal. I accept the truth. I stop pretending to be something I am not and I accept the truth. And I become aware of that. Then I read the chapter in the book and I understand the concept. To me, not taking things personal simply means that I don't assume responsibility for someone else's will. I only control to the tips of my own fingers. I only control my perception. I only control my will. I don't 
assume responsibility for you. To me, that's not taking things personally, just respecting myself. That's how I understand it, at least. Okay. So you take that first step. I accept the truth. I take things personal. That's a be- huge step to begin to accept yourself just the way you are. Then you begin to understand how not to take it personal, which is you understand the concept. But here's the thing. I can't practice not taking things personally in the past because life no longer exists there. I can't change a no to a yes or a yes to a no. And I can't practice it in the future. I can only practice it in the present moment. So at the moment, I have nothing to take it personally. So I begin to look myself. You can say it's where the total contract comes in. I begin to pay attention to myself, which simply means being honest with myself. What triggers me to take things personal? What are the things out there, like my dad wearing pajamas at a restaurant, or a guy, some guy, uh, uh, or, or someone posting something on social media? We look for those triggers, and once we recognize them, okay. First, like I said before, we accept the fact that we accept we take things personal. We understand the concept of not taking things personal. Now we know what are our triggers to take it personal, but we want to practice it so. Let's log on to Facebook, scroll down, and there's the name. The moment of truth is here. I scroll down. It's a doozy. At that moment, I have a choice. If I take it personal, it's because I want to take it personal. If I don't want to take it personal, I'm also free to say yes to not taking it personal. I'm free to say yes to either one. If I take it personal, I already accepted myself like that, and I'm free to say yes to it but I'm also free to say yes to not taking it personal. This is personal freedom. And saying yes to not taking it personal with that awareness, that's when I use that agreement as an instrument that informed my decision, but I'm the one who made the decision. I'm the one who used the effort. And practice makes the master. Kind of like when you read a cookbook. If you read a cookbook, but you never apply the recipe, you'll never know what the meal will taste like. The only way to know is if you follow each and every step of that recipe, and if you succeed the first time, great. If you don't succeed the first time, great. At least you tried. Yes. And every time you practice it, you'll get better and better until the point you start adding ingredients, changing ingredients, making the temperature fit your preference, and that's when that recipe becomes a life. And if you apply that same thing to all the teachings that are around the world, to all our ancestors, Man, we can see that humanity has created all these beautiful traditions that allows us to let go of conditional love and embrace unconditional love. And then there's that final step to forgive ourselves for ever saying yes to conditional love in the first place. Yeah, amazing. It always comes down to that part. Amazing. Yeah, I was just thinking there's, there's, there's opportunity from moment to moment to do the work. And like you said, you've got to turn philosophy into applied application and actually physically do the work. Exactly. That's, that's when life becomes your teacher, because up to that point, the mind is the teacher and the mind can corrupt it complete, ten, continuously. But as soon as we, it, we turn into something practical, something that we convert it into our life, that's when life becomes our teacher. Action, yeah. reaction. Yeah, amazing. I, there's one more question I want to ask you before we change gears on the podcast. But um, and that's related to what we're talking about. And I've heard you talk about the term mirroring mm-hmm. and how we can judge others, but we're actually seeing ourselves in them. Can you just explain a little bit? Or, or your, your thinking? Well, about? you can say mirroring is a form of we project our own beliefs onto other people. You know, one of the biggest mistakes we can ever make is thinking that everyone thinks the same way as we do. It's a mistake. We all think of it differently. Mirroring is simply seeing yourself in other people. Now, if we have domestication in our heart, for example, using them once again, the four agreements and using them to domesticate myself, turning them into the four conditions, then my wife, honey, you're Mrs. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Here's the four agreements. Read it. <laughs> and at that point, because it's a lot easier to practice the four agreements if everyone reads it. So at that point, I begin to domesticate her. Honey, you did. You just make an assumption. You didn't read the book, didn't you? Oh, how embarrassing! You're taking things personal. I only hang out with people who are impeccable with their own word. Hmm. At that moment, I am punishing her. I'm judging her. 
You see, whenever we judge someone, we're punishing them for agreements they never made, but we're forcing them to make the agreement through the judgment. So you can say mirroring, you can say that one, we project ourselves onto other people and we see ourselves or an element of ourselves onto them and we begin to domesticate them to fit our perception of who we think they should be. At that point, this is projection. But when we mirror ourselves in a different way, if we clean the mirror, and what I mean by that, I begin to see them as they are. Then I re become aware that the things that I don't like about them are the things that I don't like about myself. And the things I like about them are the things I like about myself. I begin to see myself like that, and I can learn from that, learn from that lesson. Ultimately, we all mirror each other in different degrees. So one of the key concepts that we, tr we can say we work towards is to let go of that mirror and become aware that I am the truth, just as that person is the truth in her or his own world, which is the willingness to see myself. So you can say conditional love only wants to see what it wants to see. Unconditional love allows me to see the person as they are, which means it starts with myself. I can't give what I do not have. And if I begin to heal the relationship between me and me, that I stop using my mind as my active domesticator by doing all the work and forgive myself for ever believing in those conditions, then slowly but surely, I will heal the relationship between me and me. And I'll start seeing myself as I am, as opposed to a projection that I wanted to see. Once I do that, I'm able to see the person that's in front of me or see you as you are, not as I want to see you, but as who you really are. At that point, mirroring, well, is just, another word yeah at that point i get to see you as you are i'm no longer blinded by my mirroring but mirroring at first when we first start using it is an instrument to see ourselves to see our domestication to become aware of our domestication and then little by little we begin to let go of it we can begin to clean it that's why in our tradition the smoky mirror is such a powerful thing you can say that it starts out with becoming aware that there's a fog that doesn't allow me to see beyond the tips of my nose. Then there's a moment of clarity and all of a sudden I see a mirror. And I think the mirror is the truth. And I have to do everything the mirror says I'm supposed to do. And little by little I have another moment of clarity, a lot more work, and then I think that the mirror and me are one. Then I become aware that the mirror is just reflecting me. And that I am the truth. And that there's always been just one, one truth, which is me. You can say life. Yeah. From that point of view, it's no longer about the mind. It's about this, the living being that gives life to everything in the world. And, and what and have the universe. Noticed, yeah, that's so well explained. You know, um, and what I've noticed as well, just from myself doing the work over the years, it's been very um, energetically freeing. Like, mm -hmm. and it's it it's almost I didn't realize how much effort it took to project our will on other people, even though we're doing it subconsciously, you know, and mm -hmm. it's been, yeah, been a game changer. Well, well, we became masters of it. It became natural. And so now that we have the aha moment, we just change the direction and we do it with baby steps. Not, you know, if we try to do it big steps, we're just going to corrupt it. We start little by little, always asking ourselves, what do we want out of life? How do I want to live this life? Mm -hmm. Where do I want to start? And why am I doing it? Yeah. Because I want to because I, I want to feel this connection with myself and this connection with everyone. And I want to find this harmony within me. Yeah. And I think that's probably the first step, isn't it? Because we want to do it, to do the work. Like you have to want it's, to do it. Yes, yeah, the motivator. It's what allows someone to let go of uh, drugs and alcohols that go through rehab or many other things is the things that motivates us. You know, like, for example, when couples are asking me for advice, I, I ask them both, do you guys want to stay together? If they both say yes, the rest is easy because you have the motivator that allows you to move through this, to find solutions because you love each other. If you both say no, that also, that's also easy. It's when one says yes and the other one says no, that makes it kind of complicated. You're trying to convince the other person and then domestication comes in. But when you both love each other, that's what the motivator is. So imagine with ourselves, I'm doing it because I love myself. And that's the motivator. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I am. Um, 
I have a couple of questions I ask everyone on the show. Just change gears um, mm -hmm. while we come towards the end. Um, what's one of your low points in your life you've had, but later in life turned into be a blessing? Whew, that's many. That's <laughs> many, 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 many. Oh, wow. Wow, I have to choose. Hmm. Uh, a moment of heartbreak. You know, you can say that uh, for me, I did, I started, I, even though I started at, when I was 14 to do all this work, it was the moment where I broke up with someone or something, she broke up with me. And it was someone that I couldn't project anymore. You know, up to that point, I was able to project fault or blame to someone else. But this one, I could not find it. It's like, it felt like a freight train. You know how a freight train, you start, you know, get, putting layer, uh, little, little, uh, little cart after cart and you just make it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and also it crashes and a whole thing just falls oh, together yeah. you know there's relationships as up, up to that up until that age where i just put it underneath put it in didn't you know I, I just didn't do any of the work to heal my heart to heal my mind it's always their fault and all kind of thing and then i had that one relationship where i could not project it was me and the biggest heartbreak is that i wasn't what i pretended to be and with the with the loss of that love i'm like you know, there was, uh, it was definitely a heartbreak. And the heartbreak, besides losing this beautiful angel, uh, was discovering that I wasn't who I pretended to be. And that was just as heartbreaking as the both. It was the both common culmination. It was also rough, uh, around the time where my father had this heart attack, so add that to that. And you can say that's where I started doing this work. It's the moment where I stopped seeing this work as something that belonged in a, in a museum or in a textbook. What does that have to do with me? And I started seeing it as an instrument that informed my choice, and I began to do the work and give myself time to heal. So if anything, well, the one thing I've learned throughout all of this is that we heal with our own permission. Mm -hmm. If we try to live up to an image and all that kind of thing, and that image doesn't allow us to cry or or give ourselves time to heal or talk to someone or let it out then that's not giving ourselves permission because our body naturally heals so for example if i have a scratch and i and i started to bleed in my arm and it started to heal with a scab and i start scratching at that scab and it's bleeding again i didn't give my body permission to heal now our emotional body is exactly the same it heals with time it heals with letting the truth in to, ex to express it. And, it. and it heals with our permission. If we don't give it permission, I'll never heal. So you can say that you know, I reached a point in my own experience in life where how I define myself, you know, as a Mexican, American, or whatever, and try to, by the love of someone and be accepted by, you know, other people, exactly domestication. I had to reclaim my own power. So that was the nugget. I had to do the work. It's the idea of like, oh, I'm Domingo Ruiz Jr. This is automatic. It's automatic for me. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's work. It's, it's, it's the willingness to work. You know, you could say, even, even being Domingo Ruiz Jr., there's, it's a trap in and of itself. I can believe the illusion and never lick it myself and I can have a big, huge ego. Or I do the work. Yeah. And that's where I say that's what keeps me humble. It's, I'm constantly practicing what I've learned. You know, someone asked me once, is becoming a master of self being always happy? And the answer says, no, no. Life will throw curves at, curve balls at you. It, life, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Life will give me hard times, just as it'll give me good times. If I do this work, it allows me to enjoy the good times when it's here. When the hard times are here, I have these instruments that allows me to get through these difficult times to keep the story moving and find the healing in my heart. And that's what this work is all about, to allow me to enjoy life by enjoying being myself, which allows me to enjoy the relationships I have with the people in my life. And that all came from a moment of heartbreak when because of my actions and my selfishness and my not willingness to see myself as I am, there was a consequence that hurt. Yeah. But in that, it showed me the truth. 
I was pretending to be something I wasn't, and that's what made me hurt. Yeah, thank you. For because sharing. had I, had I had I loved myself that, that way, it would have been different. But the what ifs? Who cares about the what ifs? It's the what now, and that's this is the consequence of that. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Don Miguel. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone tonight in any time frame of the world, like past or present, who would it be and why? My family. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my kids, my father, my mom, my brothers, my, the people in my family, the people I love, everyone, you know. And my family, it's not just them. It's my cousins, it's my uncles, my aunts, it's my, my best friends, my friends, my neighbors, everyone who I'm, I'm in a relationship with. I, 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 I enjoy spending time with them. Yeah, I bet that would make a great dinner party too. I have no yeah, idea. it does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. And uh, last question, um, is it, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know? What is one thing about myself that most people wouldn't know? Hmm. Hmm, that's a good one. I don't know what people don't know. Um, I, I'm really into music. I love to read. I, uh, I've... I used to watch a lot of TV, but I'm watching less and less now. I'm enjoying books more. I, I love hearing, reading about historical figures. I like biographies. I love fiction. I love science and astrophysics and things like that. I enjoy that time. I enjoy reading and, and listening to music. Um, of course, the one thing I, ever got last night, I enjoy time, spending time with the people I love. Yeah. But in my alone time, in my, my time to myself, I like to read I like to listen to music and I love to run and I enjoy running a lot. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on after everything we've covered today? There's been so much. You know, well, questions? I would just simply say, enjoy your life. You know, if you really want to know who, you're, who you are, all you have to do is take a breath and enjoy taking that breath. Enjoy being alive. While there's life, anything is possible, including healing the wounds the conditional love left in our life. Perfect. Thank you. And thank send, you, Guy. Sending anyone to uh, where's the best place to send them to your website? Well, our websites. You know, my 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 my, my own is www.miguelruizjr.com. That's miguelruizjr.com. Mm -hmm. My father's is miguelruiz.com. That's the family. That's the home base. You can say my father's website. We have social media, Facebook and things like that, Twitter and Instagram. I'm very active in Instagram. Oh, but uh, yeah, I like, I like it better than the other formats. It's, it's, I like, it's, it's a bit more enjoyable. Still, it's still innocent. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> uh, the Twitter and Facebook has gotten a little, I'm like, okay. I like, I like Instagram. It's, we, we share art with one another. But uh, we're we're there, and uh, but our home base, our website is our website. Beautiful. Well, I'll make sure I link to all the show notes um, when this goes live. And uh, so, Miguel, I just want to acknowledge everything that you do, uh, the work you've done. It's it's had a profound impact on myself personally over the years. You and your family's Thank work, you. and uh, it's been an honour for me to share this conversation with you today and be able to share it with my community here in Australia. And no doubt, everyone that's going to listen to this is going to take something magical away from it because that was amazing thank you so much oh a pleasure guy thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you so much for your compassion and and uh for, you know we were do, we were supposed to do this interview the other day but my my daughter was sick so we we rescheduled it i want to say thank you so much for being generous with me in that way so thank you you're welcome you're welcome thank you very much thanks <laughs>